Do you recognize this symbol? Odds are you do. You can see it all over the place, on t-shirts, on souvenirs, as tattoos. We all know that this symbol is a positive one. Maybe that it brings good luck, or is protective, and so on. But you'd be surprised how often I get asked what this symbol's precise meaning actually is. And that is our topic for today. Hi everyone, I'm an Egyptologist, and I answer your Ancient Egypt questions. Some time ago, someone asked me what this symbol means. The friend asking already knew that this was the Eye of Horus, but didn't quite know what it symbolizes. To answer this question, we're going to dive deep into ancient Egyptian religion and mythology, and it all starts with the myth of Osiris. The ancient Egyptians believed that long ago, way back in mythological times, when the universe was still young, Egypt was ruled by Osiris himself. His wife, the queen, was Isis. And then there was his envious brother Seth, who wanted to be the king himself. To get his hands, or rather his behind, on the throne, he plotted to kill his brother. He secretly took his measurements and had a beautiful chest made just his size. When it was time to celebrate Osiris' successful rule, he had the chest brought out, announcing that he would give it as a gift to whoever fit in it the most snugly. So one by one, everybody climbed in to have a shot at taking this prize home. And when it was Osiris' turn, Seth's accomplices nailed it shut, sealed it with molten lead, and threw it in the Nile. Now, what came next was a very long series of events that is deserving of its own video. If you would like me to tell you all about it, please let me know in the comments down below. But basically, the bottom line is that Osiris was killed, in this case, by drowning. Why do I say in this case, though? Well, this is in fact only one version of the events, but it is actually sadly also the only one that has come down to us as a clear narrative, as a story. Not just that, but it was written very late, by Egyptian standards that is, in the first century AD by the Greek philosopher and historian Plutarch, which is still 2000 years ago, mind you. Also, by this point in time, the earliest glimpses of this story that we get are from the pyramid texts from the Old Kingdom, which is to say nearly 2500 years even before that. In other words, when Plutarch wrote down this story, it was already 2500 years old, which is like us today dealing with a story from 500 BC. But here's the thing, all we get before Plutarch is just that, glimpses. Mentions in passing, obscure references, often contradictory. You see, texts like the Pyramid Texts, or their more famous descendant, the Book of the Dead, they were intended to aid the deceased in reaching the afterlife. On the one hand, the deceased likely already knew one version or another of the story of Osiris, so there was no actual need to reiterate everything in detail. It was simply assumed to be common knowledge. On the other hand, even if the deceased did not necessarily know it, in detail at least, that didn't matter. The point wasn't to teach them about the events of the myth, but to aid them in reaching the afterlife. It didn't matter that they didn't know everything in detail. What mattered was that the passing, couched references to the story of Osiris were enough to activate the magical power that would enable the deceased to overcome this or that danger when they were on their way to the afterlife. But going back to the story, the death of Osiris and Seth's taking over the throne set the stage for what would happen next. According to all versions of the myth, Isis gives birth to the son of Osiris, Horus. Isis was incredibly well versed in magic. In some versions at least, she brought Osiris back to life for just long enough for them to do the business together. Long story short, she becomes pregnant and gives birth to the rightful heir to the throne, Horus. Horus grows up hiding in the delta, whose lush marshes were the perfect place to hide from Seth. But Horus and Isis aren't alone. 
In the streams and papyrus thickets of these marshlands lurk the other denizens of this place. This episode is a crucial part of the overall story, and how Isis protected the child Horus from harm is the basis of a great many magical spells. In the end, thanks to his mother Isis and others, primarily Thoth, the god of the moon and knowledge, Horus overcomes the dangers of the delta. Here we can see the child Horus standing victorious over these dangers who were perceived as Seth's agents. This was a tremendously powerful and popular icon. Sure, it symbolizes Horus overcoming this difficult episode of his life, but this also foreshadows what was yet to come, his ultimate victory over Seth. Plutarch tells us Horus and his followers fought against Seth and his forces in a great battle that lasted many days. Horus won, and the gods ruled that he was the legitimate heir of his father, the deceased king Osiris. Osiris had now become the ruler of the land of the dead when he was once the king of the living, of Egypt. While Horus has taken his place on the Egyptian throne in the land of the living above. As you can see, Horus was represented as a majestic falcon, or as a human with the head of a falcon. This powerful raptor that flies high up in the heavens, swooping down to catch its prey, was seen as a perfect representation of kingship. The very name Horus is thought to ultimately derive from the ancient Egyptian word Heru, meaning the distant one, referring to the falcon's lofty flight. If we are to sum up Horus and call him the god of something in one word, it would be this. Kingship. But what does all this have to do with the Eye of Horus? Interestingly, Plutarch only brings this up well after the bit in which he gives us a cohesive narrative of the Osiris and Horus myth. He talks about how Horus never really fully annihilated Seth and Chaos, but rather that he has taken away his activity and strength. This has allowed the beautiful world created by the Sun God to continue existing albeit with the continued stain of chaos upon it. There are earthquakes, there is bad weather, disease comes up every now and then, wars happen, and yet, all in all, things are okay. The world is livable. In fact, it's a great place. It just isn't perfect. But that's the thing. For the ancient Egyptians, this tinge of chaos was absolutely essential for continued life. The sun had to die, that is to say set in the western horizon in order to be reborn in the east and once again reach the zenith of his power. The annual flood had to come, submerge and drown plants in order for the soil to be renewed, and without it the new crops would not grow after the harvest. People have to die in order to be reborn in the afterlife. Death was necessary, but it was only temporary. New life would always rise again. Most tellingly, among the things that Plutarch lists is the waning of the moon. He tells us that Seth snatches it, that is the Eye of Horus, out and swallows it. End quote. Fascinatingly, we get some glimpses of this in ancient Egyptian sources. I'm personally not aware of anything that mentions Seth consuming the Eye of Horus per se, but it is definitely clear that one of Horus's eyes is damaged by Seth. It is generally assumed that this has happened in one of the battles between Horus and Seth, but this seems to come mostly from Plutarch. And even he doesn't explicitly say so. In the ancient Egyptian sources themselves, we get a different version of the events and it involves some not so family friendly things. Let's just say that Seth tries to take advantage of Horus and let's just leave it at that. Now, let me ask you, what is the most powerful symbol of falcons or birds of prey in general for that matter? Some of you might say that it's their beaks or razor sharp claws or perhaps their large and powerful wings that enable them to soar at such great heights. And you would all be right. But there's something else too, one that really captivated the ancient Egyptians. 
it's the falcon's eyes. Let's not forget that birds of prey like eagles and falcons have incredible eyesight. So it was that the falcon's eye, represented like this here, was the quintessential symbol of Horus and the thing that represented his power. And the markings around the eye aren't made up. If you look at actual lanner falcons, or Falco biarmicus for you biologists and ornithologists out there, you'll see how the ancient Egyptians were representing their eyes really faithfully. I mean, look! So, with Seth's actions, Horus was hurt. In more figurative terms, his eye, the very symbol and essence of his divine power, was damaged. Thankfully though, Thoth intervened and as the ancient Egyptians put it, filled his eye. He restored it. This made it the perfect symbol for regeneration and healing. Now you know what the Eye of Horus symbolizes. But it gets better. The very word for the Eye of Horus in Egyptian, that is the ancient Egyptian language, was Wedjat, which in itself comes from the verb Wedja, meaning to be safe, uninjured, healthy, intact, unscathed. You get the idea. Although that meaning can be taken literally as describing the state of the eye, there's another way you can look at it. Calling it intact or healthy could also be a way to refer to it in its desired state. Put differently, you're calling it that even though you know it may not be intact right now or that it soon isn't going to be. Because that's the thing. Although the injuring of the eye could be seen as something that happened once upon a time in the distant mythological past, it was also a constantly repeating process. The eye was, and still is, perpetually being injured only to be filled again. This cycle reflects a cosmic process that is on constant repeat. Can you think what that might be? the waxing and waning of the moon. Or, as I found out while preparing this video, the lunar libration. What this means is that the eye of Horus is also the moon. The new moon, when it is completely invisible, is the eye when it was damaged slash torn out. But then begins the slow process of it being refilled by Thoth, who in addition to being the god of writing, knowledge, and magic, was also a lunar god. Now, there is this very ancient conception in ancient Egyptian religion where Horus is this immense cosmic deity. One of his eyes was the sun and the other was the moon. And this brings us to a very important point about ancient Egyptian religion. It wasn't a dogmatic belief system that was reliant on one sacred book. Rather, it was the result of different beliefs from local traditions across Egypt that developed together over millennia influencing one another. That's spatially. On a chronological dimension, as new ideas developed over time, they were simply tacked on to existing beliefs. The result is this patchwork of traditions from different places and time periods that is not necessarily coherent and very often even contradictory. So Horus, this cosmic deity whose eyes are the sun and the moon, is also at the same time the descendant of the sun god who had to fight to secure his place on the Egyptian throne. And this is just one example. The story of Horus and Seth thus seems to be the result of the story of the conflict between these two gods with the cosmic version of Horus with his lunar eye quilted to it. This is a multifaceted story that both gives a mythological precedent for royal transmission, for royal succession, in that the throne is passed down to the son of the deceased king and not to his brother while also providing an explanation for cosmic processes like the lunar libration. 
But to get back to an earlier point, where I was talking about the meaning behind the Eye of Horus, the Wedjat. Although on a surface level it is to be understood as simply calling it the intact one, or sound one, because it is sound, when it wasn't before, it is also an expression of the desired outcome. Put differently, the eye, this powerful symbol of divine power, is going to be injured. So, by calling it the intact one, you're also protecting it with speech, with magic. By calling it sound, it is sound. Almost as if by calling it that, you can prevent evil from happening. Temporally, it doesn't matter because it, the I, is going to be restored forever and ever. The desired outcome of the filling of the eye is going to happen. Thus, calling it the sound eye makes it a fait accompli, something that's already been accomplished successfully before the process has ever even begun. Now, I could end the video here, and I know this has been a long one already, but if you want to dive into the symbolism here just a little bit deeper, don't click away, because it gets even better. The damaging of the Eye of Horus has this other dimension where it is also allegorical of the introduction of evil into the world. Before, it was pristine, just like the perfect created world of the Sun God as he intended it. But by its very nature, life isn't perfect. Death, illness, suffering, and everything else do exist. Soon enough, the eye of the celestial falcon, this symbol of the perfect world order, was damaged. But here's the thing, just as the sun sets only to rise again in the east, just as people die in order to be reborn in the afterlife, so the moon has to wane before becoming full again. This is the cyclical nature of the world. Crops have to be harvested, that is, destroyed, in order to give life by nourishment and they regrow. The annual Nile flood covered everything with water, symbolic of drowning and killing everything. But without it, the regenerative soil would not be deposited and the new crops would not be able to grow. Destruction is not only a part of life, it is necessary. Their being life, by definition, means there's death but death itself brings life. This is the fundamental way the ancient Egyptians viewed the world. So too could no shining symbol of perfection exist like the Eye of Horus intact in this world. The eye becoming tainted was simply inevitable, but without it, it couldn't be restored. The eye is no longer perfect, but it is now perfectly suited to be in this world. In that sense, it is perfect. But let's dive even deeper. The parts of the Wedjatai were used to express fractions, used especially for a unit to measure grain. So the left half of the eye represents half, or one over two. The iris represents a quarter, or one over four. The eyebrow represents 1 over 8. The left half of the eye represents 1 over 16. This thing represents 1 over 32. And finally, this is 1 over 164. But here's the interesting thing. Adding up 1 over 2, 1 over 4, 1 8, 1 16, 1 32nd, and 1 64th doesn't give you the perfect sum of 1. but 63 over 64. That tiny 1 over 64 is missing. According to one great scholar, Sir Alan Gardner, this remaining drop was supplied magically by Thoth. On the other hand, Tevelde, in his seminal work on the god Seth titled Seth, God of Confusion, instead argues that 1 over 64 plus 1 over 64 gives 1 over 32. 
1 over 32 plus 1 over 32 gives 1 over 16, and so on, until you end up with the complete 1. I don't think either one of them is necessarily right or wrong. Both are perfectly valid ways of reading this, and I'm really fond of both inter interpretations. There's still something hauntingly beautiful about that missing 1 over 64, though. The symbol itself is complete. There are no missing parts of the eye, and yet, it isn't complete. Something's missing. You don't know what it is, but it's there. Life is beautiful, but it is never perfect. There's always something missing. You have here a perfect symbol for the created world. There aren't any missing parts. It is the powerful Eye of Horus, symbol of divine power and of order with a capital O. But it isn't complete. This symbol, with its missing 1 over 64, is now an even better version of the Eye than the Eye was before it was ever even injured. This is divine order that has now adapted to the created world. Chaos, death, evil, disease, bad weather, and everything else, instead of being shunned, are actually factored in. They are a part of the created world. Similarly, in the older versions of the myth of Horse and Seth, Seth is not completely and utterly defeated in a great battle between good with a capital G and evil with a capital E, ending with the defeat of chaos and evil. No. Seth is allowed to coexist with the world because chaos is an integral part of it. Death and destruction are a part of the world. Undesirable, sure, but absolutely necessary. Just like we said before, the destructive flood brought with it the potential for new life just as sunset held the promise of sunrise. Life comes with destruction and destruction brings life. And this is the Eye of Horus. Yes, it is a symbol of healing and regeneration. It is also the perfect symbol for the flawed, imperfect, and yet perfect world created by the gods. The world we live in. I just want to say thank you for sticking around and watching this very long video. Like I said before, the topics we covered today are very near and dear to my heart, and have had a long and lasting impact on how I view the world. I should also say that I actually prepared this video about a year ago, and since then, my family and I went through a very difficult period. However, three weeks ago, we also celebrated a very joyous occasion. It is my hope that with this, my family and I can begin to heal, though, as I explained earlier, no healing will ever truly be complete nor permanent. Life with its imperfections is just perfect that way. And you, whoever you are and wherever you are, I wish you all healing too. Just remember how the Eye of Horus only became the sound one only by actually being injured. It only truly became adapted to the hardships of the world by being capable of healing. To use a rather hackneyed expression, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. With hardships, you learn how to heal, adapt, and grow. So may you, too, no matter what setbacks life throws your way, continue to grow and be fulfilled. Have a good night.